Welcome to Justin Hawkins Rides Again, the podcast where every week I'll be discussing the pitfalls of the music industry. This week I'll be speaking to someone very interesting and very experienced in the world of rock and guitars. It is Pete Malandrone, who is uh, Brian May from Queen's long-standing guitar tech. Now Pete and I go back years and years. In fact, he um, is the reason why uh, well, he actually suggested that The Darkness um, take on Rufus Tiger Taylor as our drummer, who has turned out to be um, our longest serving uh, golden era drummer, if you like. Um, and that's all down to Pete. We, well, I think we touch on that in the chat. You can also listen to this podcast over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify if you can't watch all of this at once. Um, but in the meantime, please, to enjoy. Okay. Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and this is Justin Hawkins Rides Again, the long-form uh, podcast, also known as the Jaws of Victory, Pitfalls of the Music Trade, featuring myself and my guest today, Pete Malandrone. Did I pronounce that correctly? That's pretty close, mate. How do you say it? Pete Malandrone. <laughs> I got it na- spot on then. Sounds like I've definitely that. I've had worse. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What What do people normally do? Oh, yeah. I, I had an address. I had a, a letter addressed to me as Pete Melon, <laughs> Melon Chrome, <laughs> Melon Chrome. Yeah. But if yeah. you just if you just say if people say, "Oh, what's your name?" and then then they don't ask you to spell it, you know you're going to get a weird one. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Pate it's, Pate Melon Pate Melon Drone. I Pate once. Melon Pate yeah. Melon Chrome. Yeah. <laughs> Pate. Malandrome is the normal one. Yeah. So anyway, um, just to let everyone know, Pete Malandrome is um, a senior uh, crew member from one of the world's greatest ever bands. Um, I think even you put this band in the top ten, surely, of all time. Um, At number one. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, definitely. At number one. one. the the band that Pete works for is Queen, and uh, you're Brian May's guitar tech. I am. So this will be packed with insights, um, behind the scenesy stuff, anything that you're allowed to say, um, and probably a few things that you're not allowed to say, which we'll edit out later. Yeah. And then we'll do like an after dark edition in a few okay. years <laughs> when it's okay to say those things. <laughs> when, yeah. when it's all blown over. Yeah. When the yeah. When yeah. When all the band members are now dead. Yeah, exactly. Then we'll be able to say what we're about to say. All right, so I'm going to do the theme tune a cappello because I didn't bring a guitar because I'm not very professional. Justin Hawkins rides again. 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 Beautiful. I did that in a slightly... Wow. um, It was a bit like the Disturbed. Like yeah, that. you went yeah, a full octave down. Yeah, I can't sing as hard as you, mate. And you added a lot of uh, anger to it as well. Are you feeling all right today? Yeah, a little bit um, Monday morning-ish. Yeah. I think usually, you know, shows Malandrone is a den of iniquity over the weekend. And then, um, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we went for it this, this weekend. I've, I've heard about your uh, legendary weekenders. Oh, what, from Schiltz? <laughs> yeah, Schiltz did mention them, actually. <laughs> Oh, so yeah. um, let's get some background on Pete Malandrone. How long have you been working for Queen? 29 years. Wow. And um, so in those early parts, what, what kind of stuff were you doing? Because um, were you working for Brian when he was doing his other projects as well? Well, I, I started in 90, early 94. Um, mm. And I sort of arrived there by accident. I mean, it's not... It's not the type of job you can really apply for. Um, yeah. I was just—it was just one of those things. I was in—I I knew somebody who was working for him, and, you know, right place at the right time, and sort of made myself useful while the studio was being built, and um, got invited to stay on a month's trial, um, which I'm still on, I believe. Yeah. Um, and so early on, I suppose the first. The, the the thing that was going on then was 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 the um, the making of Made in Heaven, which was the last the last Queen album after with all the bits they had left over of Fred singing. Yeah. And obviously, I'd never been I'd never been in a in, even a recording studio before that. Um, no, I was going to ask you actually. Were you were you doing any teching before? No, I was a telephone engineer. So my dogs just come in. <laughs> 
His name's Mr. Big. Did you hear him coming? <laughs> no, I didn't. Okay, a little bit of power. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, um, yeah, um, I'd never been in a recording studio. I'd never... Uh, I didn't have... I had nothing to do with that industry before. I used to be a telephone engineer, so... Mm. For British Telecom. Wow. Um, but it, that helped because I wasn't, I wasn't scared of wires and I wasn't scared of mm. work. Yeah. yeah. So... I know a lot yeah. of guitar techs that are scared of work, funny enough, but they don't last Ooh. very long, do they? <laughs> they don't last 30 years. <laughs> no. So it was, yeah, and I was, very much, I was very much in the studio then, really. I wasn't really, I didn't really tech for Brian until I think it was probably a couple of years later. Because mm. um, he, he had a tech then, but he, he, was a, he was a touring tech and he'd gone off to do something. Brian was playing with Meatloaf, or he was guesting with Meatloaf at Wembley Arena. And mm. Brian didn't have a tech. And um, I said, well, I'll do it. Well, it's funny how that goes, because we've found that as well. Like, on, in a year when, when like, the, the gigs are sparse, it's hard to hold on to your crew, because they need to go and... I mean, a lot of, the, lot, of the, lot of our lot end up working for Iron Maiden or right. a band that's on the road all year round. Yeah. So they've got the... They've well, got, you, you have to, because... You know, no, no matter how much you love the band you're working for, a lot of, uh, a lot, they, they have to work. And they'll take work for bands that they don't like. Yeah. Um, because it's just, it's money. You've got to pay your bills, you know. But I, I work full-time for Brian, so I've, I've never teched for anybody else. Wow. Um, uh, actually, there's one exception to that. Oh, I'd, yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was your tissue tech, wasn't I? Yeah, that's right. When we played in, um, I think it was Scotland, wasn't it? And I had a slightly yeah. runny nose, and I think you were... Uh, what? Dublin, it was. Was it Dublin? Okay. okay. Yeah. That's where, yeah, and after that gig, that was really funny. We, we played, um, we played Roadie, uh, it, I can't remember what we called it, but do you remember we were all standing there and I went into that big country house and there was like 12 windows and you all had to guess which, which one I was going to stick my ass yeah, out of. Yeah, yeah. So it was, um, what, what was that, like Roadie whack a mole Roadie arse celebrity, celebrity arse or something, I can't remember. Yeah, I don't know. But there was loads of us playing it. Everyone was like, Which window up, would Pete Mellon Jones arse pod part of next was the, was the challenge. <laughs> that was very amusing that evening. That was, that was a good day, that was. That was a, that was a really good day. Was that the day that um, the Boomtown Rats played as well? Yeah, it was. You, it, was. Boomtown, it was great, really good. I really enjoyed uh, Boomtown Rats. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've forgotten how much sort of good stuff they've done, really. Yeah, I know. They've got way more songs than you think they have. Yeah, yeah loads more. Really good ones as well. Yeah, and loads of attitude as well. I thought they were brilliant on stage. Yeah, and he was good, Geldof. I thought he might be a bit sort of, you know, as he gets on a bit, I thought he might be a bit, it might be a little bit boring, but it wasn't. It was really yeah, exciting. No, he's, he's, he's a real punker, isn't he? Like a full... Yeah, yeah, yeah proper, pro proper, yeah. proper punk. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. Um, so that was in Marley Park, wasn't it? In, in, it was. In Dublin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went to. I remember I went to the uh, American Embassy in in um, Bern in Switzerland to try and get my visa renewed to go to America, and um, I had the I had my Queen Marley Park um, AAA pass on the back of my passport, and then the person processing it was like, oh, "I was at that gig," and it made everything go much smoother. So we, we did something right, I think, on that day. Wife, <laughs> Deb, Deb's in the house. <laughs> Deb's in the house. This is I'm brilliant. trying to smoke in between episodes of Van der Pump Rules. <laughs> As you do. I've got to do. Foreign language. Yeah, that, that, that was just a noise. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, so you just walked, cool. you walked straight into the, the best sort of teching gig you can have, really, looking after one of the most valuable guitars probably in the world, I would say. Yeah, and really lucky. So going back to what I was saying, the first time I ever teched for anybody was at Wembley Arena for Brian guesting with Meatloaf. So amazing! Is that when Meatloaf did like he did like twenty nights at, at Wembley or something like that? Wasn't it? It was like he did a huge run there because it was the arena and it probably should have been. Yeah, I don't know. It's all a bit of a blur. But um, yeah, I know it was it was pretty it was pretty scary to be honest. I didn't know what I was doing. You still don't really? know what you're doing. Well, you? Nothing's yeah. <laughs> changed. You start as you mean to continue. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's really well, cool. To, 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 I, we've we've decided that to to get long longevity working for Queen, you've either got to be really really good at your job, mm. or you've got to have hair a little bit like your boss. Yeah, I did wonder if it was I, like that because like it's when you see somebody with a dog that resembles, resembles them. them. <laughs> <laughs> <Is> that... <laughs> exactly, exactly that. 
Yeah. And we yeah. both we both piss up lampposts as well. It's yeah. really <laughs> yeah. strange. Sniff each other's yeah. asses. But he does it second because he has to mark the territory after you. Exactly, done. yeah. Yeah, it's the hierarchy thing. Yeah, yeah, because he's the boss, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly, yeah. He has to wee on my wee. Yeah, otherwise yeah. it's just, yeah. Otherwise it'd be just weird otherwise, wouldn't it? It wouldn't be right. Otherwise Roger comes and sniffs it and he'll piss on top of that. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. cool. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. So when you have like... Um, I mean, I, it took took me a long time to find the right tech, really, because um, I think the most important thing that tech needs to have is eyes, eyes on you all the time, because you just never know when something's going to go wrong, and they've got to be able to react to it. And, and I've, I've worked with a lot of people that, you know, sometimes something falls off my guitar or something breaks or there's some other emergency, and then I'm sort of glancing over furiously trying to get some help and then they're just sort of polishing one of my guitars on their phone <laughs> I've seen that before as well that's an immediate sacking actually when that happens feet up <laughs> oh yeah but I've seen you with your feet up as well that's a slightly different well yeah that's when it's going really well I'll get my feet up yeah um, and yeah um, it's, I, there's a lot of important things about, about that side of it but it is I think it's it's um, you've got to be a team I mean it's it's that the guitar department at a gig is me and Brian. There's, yeah. You know, and and you have to, yeah, you have to take it seriously. I mean, I'm, you know, you know what I'm like. Just I'm. Fairly... I know you don't take very much seriously, but that's the one. Thing no, but that, but that I do, and uh, I, and immediately it's like game face on. Yeah. You know, game face ten minutes before, it's mm -hmm. game face, and then the sort of the, the pissing about stops, and you have to you have to earn your money. Yeah. And then the pissing about starts immediately when the guitar when, plays. During We Are The Champions. <laughs> yeah, <Okay. laughs> That's it. Yeah. And um, so, you know, you're, you're, so you're working for the guy with the iconic guitar. Um, and also, I mean, this whole sound is just completely recognisable, isn't it? I mean, that, that's just... And every time I see you at anything, like I, when I saw you at the... Um, uh, Taylor Hawkins stuff as well. You rock up, and then magically all those Vox AC thirties appear. Yeah. Now, are you carrying them yourself, or do you have like a, a, a sub a sub Pete that's that's doing some of the heavy lifting on that? No, I get I, I I've got a, I've got a terrible terrible bad back. Strangely, from lifting AC thirties. I can imagine that. Yeah, because they're quite awkward they're, and they're low as well, aren't they? You need to. They're low them. and they're yeah, they're hard to, to and they're really heavy. And for those uh, you can't tell from this, but you're you're really tall as well, aren't you? Yeah. Are you as tall yeah. as Brian actually? About the same height, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. About the, I think but we're both. About, it's about six foot two or something. I think. Yeah. Um, he looks taller in clogs, and the hair is higher. I was going to so ask he, if he makes you wear clogs for your. No, I, no. Again, it's a. It, it's you a, just choose to. It's a hierarchy thing. Then I'll be <laughs> taller than than him, and you can't. It's like you know, be like that for for the king bowing. That's, you know, absolutely. <laughs> Stay underneath. It makes good sense, actually. Yeah, and um, so um, so no, I, I get uh, as much as possible now. I I will get people, locals really, to 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 help me, and I just say, look, I'm really sorry. I've got a bad back, and I'm not lifting this. You're going to have to do it. Yeah, because otherwise, I you know, I could. I could I could lift an amp and end my career, couldn't I? Quite easily. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And well, the guitars yeah, yeah. aren't light anyway. His his guitar weighs a ton, and it's a real tree trunk neck as well. As well. It is, yeah. Baseball bats on and off, isn't it? Yeah, but you've um, you've uh, afforded me the opportunity to have a little fiddle on that guitar before, and I'd, I've been over to Brian's place and and tried them. I think I don't think they play like normal guitars. I think they the the sound that he gets out of them. Is it's wild to me. He must have really strong hands. You ever you ever arm wrestled him? Um, no, just in case I beat him. Yeah, of course that wouldn't be acceptable. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, no. He's he, but he's he's got massively long fingers, like really really long, and he he manages. I don't know how he does it. When you play like when I play a bar chord, I I use this yeah. finger to bar. He gets his thumb. Yeah. He can get his thumb almost over like the the bottom four strings. It's, it's, he's yeah. got amazing wow. grip on, and with that size and neck as well. Yeah, and he, he, I've, he very very rarely see Brian 
playing a bar chord with, with that finger. It's more or less always he's got the Is thumb it? right okay, over the top. Okay, that's interesting. Mm. I like to do so a bit of both because sometimes, sometimes when you do like <clears throat> with a thumb over, you can do more and you can have some of, these, some of those uh, strings open. Yeah. If you're doing a G, that's pretty handy. You know, you can do that. Mm. Um, because then you get an extra G that rings out. Yeah. Who'd have thunk it? It's the Everybody's nerd alert. What's a G? <laughs> yeah, about the about the, the the sound and stuff, and and uh, and apart from during the show, obviously, if something goes wrong, you have to you have to fix it, but you have to fix it quick. You can't stop mm -hmm. everything, and you know. So I, I I've built in contingency plans for more or less everything that's ever gone wrong, and that, that's the other thing. If something goes wrong, it's it's okay that it goes wrong, but you can't let it go wrong again. You can't keep the, the, the mis not the mistake but the, the, the fault can't keep happening because then th that's 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 bad that's so, on you you know everyone you? knows it. everything goes you know lots of things go wrong as you, as you know but most mm. of the time it will only probably be me and brian that notice it yeah. because it's it's quite he'll come to me if he's in trouble um and, and often i can spot the problem or hear the problem that's very important that you I, uh, what you said about looking, but you, I also have to listen. I tried, I tried using ear defenders once, and I just I couldn't work like it because I can hear the amps properly, and I can yeah. hear them going. I can hear when something's going wrong that end or at his end. Um, yeah. But it's it's tricky on those big stages. You've you've seen the sh you've seen the show right with the big long the big long e ego ramp that they've got. Now mm -hmm. if he's down the end of the, if he's down the end of that, I'm I'm knackered. I'm I can't do anything down there. You know, even if, even a guitar change takes. <laughs> by the time yeah. I hobble down there and he hobbles back and we meet halfway, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it just takes for ages. So you just got your fingers crossed. You that, should pack him a spare. You, you should pack him a spare yeah, on his back so they can swift, swap it out himself. Yeah, yeah. But again, on, on the on the on the lift, you know, mm. he busted a string up on the lift, it's, and everyone's running around screaming, shouting, "He's yeah. busted a string! He's busted a string!" Oh well, okay. Well, either get me a ladder or I'll bring him down. There's nothing. I could, what am I going to do? Jet I can't do anything. He's up there. Police system. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and yeah, those the, the AC thirties. We're jumping around a bit, but the, the, the AC thirties. My main thing, which I've always thought, is I don't. I don't. It's not broken. The sound is not broken, and it's yeah. and it's 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 keeping that sound the same. Yeah. Um, but building in as much reliability as you possibly can. Yeah. Because it was quite. It was quite a fragile system when I took it over. Because um, he, he, he famously, or, you know, I suppose it's um, anecdotally, he's AC30s, the guitar that he built with his father, and, um, and then it's like, isn't there some sort of treble boost thing that goes in, in line yeah. somewhere? Is that before? And that's, that's it. Before? Yeah. Yeah, it's before, so it goes... It goes it goes guitar, treble booster, AC30. Now I could, I could do, on that setup, I could do, I could do every, every show. If I, if I could, if I could guarantee that he, that he wouldn't blow an amp up, mm. then I, I, I could quite easily do a whole show on two leads, one treble booster, one AC30 and him carrying that guitar. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a few little tweaks and and the delay stuff, and there's a bit of chorus on the three, but but really, essentially, it it that's all it is is a. a guitar. When you say the chorus on the three, is there a way of fiddling with the phase so that the three amps create that chorusy sound, or is that? Well, it's a, it's a stereo chorus, but the middle one is the middle one is dry, yeah. so it's a very very wide chorus sound. It's a bit, well, you've heard it right when you hit that yeah. when you hit a big E, and it's. It's just amazing. I mean, yeah, it doesn't sound like anybody else in the world. No, it doesn't. Well, it doesn't. But it sounds like it. He, he, he. The difference between me playing it, or you playing it, and him playing it, it, it might as well be a completely different setup because you're, you know, a fairly proficient guitar player. Just fairly. <laughs> That's I'll accept that. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you're a great guitar player, and um, you'd sound. You sound nothing, nothing like him at all. Yeah. And if he picked up your guitar, he would sound like him. Hmm. It, he would sound like like Brian May. Yeah, That's it's cool. in his fingers. You're saying this is what I've always assumed, actually, because he has a very particular sort of vibrato and and taste yeah. to the way he plays as well. 
and the way he uses dynamics is super impressive. So when he gets yeah. to those sort of like twangier sounds, is that stuff on the guitar? Like, is he pulling pots out to make split split? Um... No, um, it's it's all to do with the phase switches. If he's got a, like kind of thing like the Bohemian Rhapsody start, I think it's the yeah. the 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 um, bridge and middle out phase. I think it is, um, and it really and and things like I'm loving my car. Um, mm. If he puts those trisonics out of phase with each other you get a very it's quite a shrill quite harsh sound mm. um but it's it's all to do with it's all to do with the way he uses the volume there's no mm. there's no there's no splitting there's no push pull parts there's no there's none of that it's, it's all to do there is one he's got a mark on the back of the guitar which is the sweet spot for the start of, un, of under pressure and it's that really glassy sound yeah. because that, that the original with that was played on a 12 string but but obviously swapping 12 strings and stuff is just a pain. But, but to get that really glassy sound, it's a, it's a, a specific place on that on the, Within on the that string volume. that he has to strike it, you mean? Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's, when it's low down, it's not driving the amp as hard. And as soon as he whacks it up, it just saturates the guitar and you get that, you get that amazing mm-hmm. sort of rock, classic Brian May yeah. Sound. So, in fact, all the dynamics and stuff are just coming from his hands, really, aren't they? It's all him. Yeah, it's it's all him. It's all him. I I I do. I I can't apart from turning the radio system down. I can't really, I can't really alter him a lot from there because all the, the the amps are on full full tilt anyway. Um, so the, yeah, there's uh, um, all I all I'm doing is is I'm I'm switching his buttons so. There's there's little little things for the delay setting and there's little tweaks and stuff that you do, but yeah, yeah. and and a couple of harmony bits as well. Uh, in, in when they when they play um, Seven Seas Rye after mm-hmm. the diddly 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 that bit there's a there's a harmony on that, so I have to hit that for oh, one. Oh, there's a harmonizer. In so I wondered if you meant you yeah. you sit there with another guitar and hit that. No, because you can play, can't you? you? You're a player, aren't you? Um, I, I'm a guitar owner, just yeah, okay, yeah. I, I I used to play, I used to play quite a bit, um, and I sort of I, I gave up really. And I started working for him. I mean, the, the most I ever play really is at Soundcheck. Yeah. The, oh yeah, you need um, to be able to hit a, hit a chord, surely. Yeah. Well, you got yeah, you got to give the sound man a chance. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I know a few Queen songs just because it's it's easier for the for the sound man to at least give him a chance. Um, but I yeah, I, I play. I play with my mates when I'm drunk, and then I'm really rubbish. Well, I put put in a performance on one of your special Christmas uh, edition. What was the you song did. that we did? Gertcher or something? Uh, on Gertcher, <laughs> which is a um, Chaz and Dave cover, isn't it? it? Yeah, Chaz and Dave cover. Yeah, it's um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Again, that was that was lockdown boredom. Oh, that was what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was lockdown boredom. Battle of the bands with all our mates and stuff. Yeah. Cracking version of Every Rose Has Its Thorn. Have you seen that one? Oh, you I mean, I, I I adore that song, as you know. It's like I was probably so moved by it that I've deleted it from my memory. Yeah. <laughs> but again, it's anything that's simple, isn't it? That's yeah. why I play simple stuff. Yeah, simple but brilliant. <laughs> well, not really. No, Brian's very but Brian's very complimentary about my guitar playing, but yeah, he he doesn't know the real me when it comes to guitar playing. <laughs> I'm dreadful. <laughs> You're always uh, just doing the stuff that you really know when you play in front of him, probably. Yeah, yeah. funny enough, at, that, at Marley Park, I think, um, I don't think you were there, but Schultz turned up and um, I, I played Thing Called Love. And I thought, oh, that was, that was quite good. And Schultz just went down the microphone, you're playing that riff wrong. <laughs> 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 I, he says that to me all the time as well. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I, was just, I, I watched it on YouTube. I saw how you did it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've never played it right. It's, no, uh, me neither. Yeah. Um, so when you, so if you started, uh, when did you say it was? Mid, mid, early, mid 90s? Early 94. Okay. So were you, were you working for Queen when, when, uh, when they did that Pavarotti and Friends? Yes. Okay. Because Spike tells a brilliant story about how in the sound check, um, Pavarotti was, was sort of at the front doing the singing and then Brian May comes in and then with the 
probably set to normal gig level. You might have even rolled it back a little bit just out of... I didn't, really, I didn't roll it no, back. Perhaps you didn't then. And then, um, so then Brian May hits a chord and, it's, sent, and it, it's so loud that Pavarotti's hair's flying forwards. And then, uh, and then I think somebody from Pavarotti's team went over and, and um, said to Brian, or, or you perhaps, um, the maestro asks if the guitar might be a little softer. He, 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 it was the, his guy came over to me and said, Maestro would, would like you to turn that down. Mm-hmm. And I, my answer was, my Maestro doesn't fucking turn down for anybody. <laughs> and, off he, and off he trotted. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that was, a, that was a weird old gig. What's the I, plural was, of Maestro then? Maestri, perhaps? My, 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 um, mouses. Oh, mouses. Yeah, mouses, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's battle yeah. Of the, the two mouses, mouses together. Yeah. <laughs> Pavarotti. Yeah, brilliant. That's, That's the stuff. Nice. That is it. That's going in. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> but yeah, he was, he was a bit, yeah, he was, yeah, he's, I mean, brilliant, but a bit of a funny guy, Pavarotti. Yeah. Strange man. Yeah. I did hear that um, for an event like that, um, he would have his own toilet facilities, which were, Reinforced. <laughs> I think it was. I think it was. No, I'm not joking. He had his but own like, toilet. Um, but the seat would be bigger. Like, so there's, you know... The, yeah, it was like a double, you know, a double, a double stacker. Like a love seat. One of those portaloos, but, you know, all done inside with plush velvet and, you know... Yeah. But, yeah, I think it was a... And it had, it had on it Pavarotti only... Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't want to go in there. Which uh, on a tour bus, you see, you see, uh, you, you see something else only, um, because on a tour bus, as we all know, you know, number twos are not allowed. So, so it would say Pavarotti only, and, and please no solids, something like yeah. that. Yes. <laughs> but I'm, I mean, looking at the size of that guy, I imagine he can really pack a good old shit, can't he? So you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to go in there after. You would not want to go in there after him, would you? Yeah, that would be yeah. a mess. I think probably what happens is when he closes the door behind him, a, a timer goes, and then it's just do not. It's like the, there's a deadlock that engages, and then after a certain period of time, it yeah. opens just for health and safety. Industrial fan cuts in. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! This is the stuff. This is the stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, that that was yeah, it was amusing. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people just go when when I fire that rig out. I said, Holy Christ! Yeah. Is it supposed to sound like that? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Music yeah. to my ears. That is. Yeah, because I think when um, when we did the Taylor stuff. Because um, that that was a brilliant arrangement. I love the way the stage looked because it had everybody's amps in a sort of jen- um, you know Tetris kind of vibe. Yeah. They're all some people were on combos and there was there was um, you know stacks and all sorts. And then you had like all your stuff over at stage right, right. Left. Stage left. How does that work? Stage left is when you're looking out at the audience. When you look when if you're standing on the stage looking out at the audience, it's it's my left. Your left. My left. Yeah, I never get that right. Okay, so stage left, you had a a good amount of amps in that area yeah. there, and it was just overpowering. And I, that's those are the only gigs that I've done in the last sort of thirty years without any earplugs or any sort of because I just wanted to sort of witness that really, you know. And it was crazy. It was, well, it looked it it sounded great, didn't it? That I mean, no, yeah. the the whole thing was just. Mm. How they got that production together and the amount of people that were there. I mean, it was super, that was superb. And, and it was sad. It was sad. Mm. But but I found those two gigs really uplifting. For, yeah. uh, do you know what I mean? It was very, very sad. And seeing his kids and his, and, and his, his wife, Alison, there, it was just, I can't imagine what they were going through. But then when his son, is it, is it Shane? Is his name Shane? Yeah. When he got up and played the drums... I, I almost cried. It was he was I, so brilliant. I did wasn't he? cry, and I saw yeah. you fighting the tears. Yeah, it's incredible, and it's just it's very moving. I mean, it's, it was. Yeah, those were amazing right. shows. They really were. They were, yeah, yeah, brilliant, yeah. I mean, obviously, that, that, that's the thing—the the devastating circumstances. But then everybody 
from the world of well, from their world of music, you know, everybody that's even remotely connected to them, all fighting together to put something special on. It was amazing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Incredible. And I was so pleased to see you there as well. It's just yeah, it was nice, wasn't it? We got to hang out a bit. For, yeah, we haven't done yeah. that. We haven't and done I think that that's, for a while. This is what I wanted to say to you about, like, um, the role of the tech is like, um, because it isn't just you're not just there to. Um, make sure all the gear works it's like an emotional support animal as well yeah. like it's uh it's not just and it's, it isn't just familiarity it's a total bond you know it, it is yeah and it's um you know if brian's having a bad night or he doesn't feel well or he's he, if he's tired and and it's it's my job to be let's like a sort of man manager and go come on mate come on this you know just go out there and look at all those people yeah look at the joy on their faces and if you're feeling a bit shit You've got, you've got, you've got to do it anyway. Yeah, and think of, really think of the money. Think of the money. That's what you always say to me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> think about the that's money. what gets me going, you know. Fuck those guys. Think about the money. <laughs> think about the check at the end. You know. Yeah, but no, it is. Yeah, it's like yeah. say, so it's, and it's a it's a tight department. It's 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 you know we both rely on each other. Yeah. You know, and it's I like to think that he he trusts me enough now to. If there is a fuck up, he he doesn't really he he doesn't he doesn't go mad at me. I can't really imagine him throwing his toys out the pram, but I do feel like with Brian, it's he's one of those guys that has like to do the things that he's done in his career, and you've done a lot of those things with him. I think there's got to be something in his in his psyche that that resembles rage. I mean, actual fury. And I feel like he has such a serene kind of demeanor, demeanor yeah, yeah. you know. That when I think I think there's there's something inside him that's just so angry. Well, you see him; he gets pretty animated about animal stuff. Yeah, that's that's probably the angriest I've ever seen. Uh, you, that's the angriest you'll ever see him. Mm. Is it is about the animal stuff? Yeah. Um, because I think he just finds it so frustrating that. Um, you know, people just shitty to animals, and it's, yeah. and it's um, yeah. And we, do, I mean, I, it's, it's changed my opinion a lot. Cause I never mm. used to think about things like fox hunting. We still, we still clash on fishing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But you know, he he would, he just says, "Well, I I disagree with it." Well, you know, if you're you're pulling a fish out and putting it back, what's the point of that? And you kind of you can't argue with that, can you? No, that's actually good logic. You can't argue with it. You're like, mm, yeah. don't know. I like it, yeah. But the, does the fish like it? No, probably not. It, 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 the anger, yeah. I think he's he's not. I think I just mean in terms of like uh, the, to, because of the Queen setup. You know, like when you listen listen to like the individuals that have written which songs, the stuff that's really rocking. Um, is often Brian's writing, but also I think some of the punky stuff as well, like the stuff that's a bit, I don't know, I think, I think he's got fire. I think he's got fire in there somewhere. Yeah. And I think it's bubbling just under the surface. It's, it's awesome to imagine, really. And I remember there was something that Anita, Anita Dobson said as well, like she said uh, that there's no, no finer sight than him when he's fully enraged. <laughs> so, you know. I'm glad you said enraged. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what was the other option? <laughs> we shouldn't go. To, we shouldn't go there. So uh, another thing that um, always makes me laugh is that the idea of like mishaps on stage, and so sometimes in a Queen production, there's a lot of moving trusses and there's hydraulic platforms and all this kind of stuff, and disappearing and reappearing pianos and. All sorts of things over the last few years, and I think during the Paul Rogers time. How, what years were Paul Rogers again? That was that uh, started in two thousand and five, I think. Right, so oh five through to about two, probably five years. I think we did about yeah. five or six tours. I think with Paul. Okay. So, I did hear an anecdote that uh, there was a, a piano that was, you know, I think an area of the stage opened. And there was a piano underneath waiting to come up on a hydraulic platform and one member of the band fell into it. Was that your your fella or was it... Uh, it uh, was Brian. Oh. Well, 
the first time it happened, it was Brian. Mm. Um, and he, he went in, luckily he went in on his back and he landed on, he landed half on the piano and half on, on Paul's tech, Marcus. Uh, and, and it was horrible because it, it looked, it looked horrendous. But he, he they, they sort of, we, we got him out because um, it was dark on the stage and he just didn't see, didn't see the hole. But, and we, we got him out and the guitar was really badly out of tune and he was obviously pretty shaken. I said, do you want to stop? Do you want to see a doctor? What do you want to do? And he went, no, no, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. But we, had, we got a paramedic up there just in case there was stuff. And it was, it was quite traumatic um, to see, because he's not only my boss, he's, he's my mate as well. And it's, it's, you know, it's horrible to see your mate in a situation like that. And it just, it just wasn't funny. I mean, if, mm. I, if I, but then a couple of days, well, actually, well, um, the other tech on the other side the next day, who's a very cheeky fellow called Justin Crew, who's Kirk Hammett's tech, he was okay. doing stage right duties. And, and he said to Brian the next day at Soundcheck, are you right after yesterday? And Brian went, yeah. And he went, I think it was just a stage you were going through. Oh, no. <laughs> Brilliant. Quite amusing. I mean, that's a that's a fine line between mm. funny and fired as well. <laughs> a couple of days later, um, the same thing happened to Paul. Paul went down the hole, mm. and it was right at the start of another one bites the dust. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the band uh, he's gone down the hole, and you can see all this scuffle about, and they just get did it in doom. Yeah. All looking at each other, boom, boom, and they yeah. went round a few times, and then Paul appeared at the side of the stage and came rushing on, and he walked Derry down the street, <laughs> and that was funny. Yeah, well, the, the rumor I heard was that um, when it happened to Paul, um, there may have been like um, some adjustments required to uh, a certain cranial accoutrement like there was a bit of <laughs> was that... I, can't, I can't possibly comment no, on okay. that okay well that's just no okay fine because after a fall like that one would imagine that uh, if there is any sort of movement movement it, that's you know and if you're rushing to get back to stage you might not notice it in time so but that okay yeah, so I, can, I, can, a... I couldn't possibly comment on that scurrilous rumour Yes, yeah, must be. I think it's just a rumor. Just yeah. But one of the things that, that that you and I have in common is a fascination for the uh, for that particular type of male vanity. Um, you will the syrup. The syrup spotting. Now, now, it's not just celebrities that you do it with. Sometimes you'll send me a picture that you've taken surreptitiously of somebody walking through an airport, and it looks a bit like he might be wearing a wig, and then we call it syrup spotting. Um, you... I love I love syrup spotting. It's one of my favourite pastimes, actually. Um, and, and and a lot of them, see, a lot of them are so bad that they can't, the pe- the wearers can't possibly think they look good. They can't. Yeah. And, and and a bald man, what's, what's wrong with a bald There's nothing wrong with a, a bald man. What's, what's wrong with just letting it go bald here and growing around the sides? Exactly. That's the Francis... Terry Hoffman. Nutkin style. Oh, Terry Nutkin. The famous... The famous lot... Do you ever wonder what it would look like if Terry Nutkin put a little toupee on that bit there? It'd just ruin the whole vibe, wouldn't it? Yeah. Or just shaved it and had a mohawk, like a false mohawk, completely the other way around. <laughs> a no-hawk. A no, yeah. But, yeah, the syrup spot, that's, that's amusing. And it amuses me because the way I do it as well is I'll... I think the one I sent to you, the guy, <laughs> the guy checking at a hotel, I just grabbed one of the other roadies and just said, stand there. I'm going to take a photo of you, but I'm not. So I'm, I stand there with my camera, pointing it so it looks like I'm taking a photo of my mate, but really I'm, I'm over his shoulder. Ah, yeah, and you're, you're actually focusing on the syrup, yeah. And then you'll send it to me, and then we'll try and analyse. Analyse, yeah, the, the, the nylonity of it. Yeah. The, the, the ones that are tough to spot are the ones made out of real hair. Yeah. Somebody should invent a, a syrup where... Okay, so, so it, grows. it sits a little bit higher on your head, but inside there is a load of sort like of the, hair that... Like the Play-Doh thing. Yeah, the mop-top hair shop. The Play-Doh thing where you just, 
and then shove the thing in the head the easy way to do it is like you have a little strap under the chin and every day you just adjust it so it's one more and then it gets a bit tighter and forces a bit more out yeah that would be good wouldn't it yeah yeah and then you re you wind it all back in for the for the haircut i don't i dye mine gray now yeah because i want i want to look even more like um robert plant you do look a bit like robert plant actually I, we me and deb went to madeira um, on a holiday, so first holiday, we went early on in the year, and the passport guy, they were really shitty because, like, we're not in Europe anymore, so you have to queue in, you know, you have to queue in a separate thing. And he was really stern face. And he looked at me, and he looked at my, and he kept on looking up, looking at my, and I thought, oh, who's going to pull me over? And he went, yeah. "Has anyone told you you look like Robert Plant?" And I was like, "Yeah, lots of people tell me that." It's brilliant. Yeah, I mean. Robert Plant. What do you think about Robert Plant? Is that a syrup or is it kind of... Robert? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. got to be real. You wouldn't have it that colour, would you? You'd, you'd have it darker. This is my defence as well. When, everyone, when anyone's accused me of wearing a wig, I say, who do you think in their right mind would buy a wig that looks like this? <laughs> and it's like, your hair's yeah, good. Your, I, I, I like your hair shorter, though. I, I, but don't I'm you, enjoying I, the short hair, actually. I, don't I think, think last, time we, last time we saw you was just after lockdown, I think, and um, at the Hexagon in Reading. Yeah. And I think you might have had really good hair extensions of oh, fucking yeah, fantastic, really, 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 really long. And yeah. I, I wanted to, I wanted, to, we, we weren't allowed to come and see you because of the oh, the COVID uh, stuff, yeah, because we were, of the yeah. COVID thing. But Deb was desperate to ask you where you got your hair extensions from because she wanted some. I can put you onto that person actually. Yes, Schilt, in fact, it's one of Schiltz's uh, daughter's friends did it for me. Oh, okay. So he'll be able to point you in their direction but um, okay oh, well that's that's good to know yeah that was that was because i had what they call a wolf cut and right. i hated it because it all curled up like and i just looked like kevin keegan i was like this is not going to do so I, if, if whenever i used to have my hair cut it always used to because they comb it out and it'd be really long and they cut a bit and it'd go yeah like that and you look like <laughs> you look like, ronald, you look like ronald mcdonald it's so frustrating when that happens isn't it i hate that hate yeah hair's annoying <clears throat> We've got a, a just, we've, just right in we've here, got in one. here, it, just in here, we have got a whole bag full of wigs. We got them for the lockdown thing. We've got some excellent ones. We've got, <laughs> so, jo- we've got loads of Joan Jett ones. You're saying that when, when, the, when the pandemic struck and everybody was panic buying toilet paper, you went and bought a bag of wigs? <laughs> no, we've got it, like, lots of different wigs. Oh, okay, we've, got whole bag, of, we've got a whole bag of wigs. We've got some corkers in there. I tell you the story. Really um, just at the very beginning of uh, COVID, we were doing a tour in, in um, Europe. We played the Zurich show, and for some reason, beforehand, Rufus and I went into uh, a wig shop, and I bought like a, a Lego Lass wig, which had a separate sort of fringe attachment to it. So you could have it either like in a you know middle part, or you could have a fringe. I don't know why I bought that, but he bought one that looks exactly like Frankie's hair. You know, like the big. You know, brown, yeah. brown afro vibe. And um, Frankie got sick during this first set. We were doing the whole of Easter is Cancelled, then we were doing a second set, and he got sick. And I, and I was sort of doing the songs, and I was noticing that his backing vocals were a bit off, you know, and I thought, oh, Frank, Frankie's having a rough night. And when it came to the end of the first set, he legged it off off the stage to the backstage area. Um, and when, when, when we got there, he was in the bathroom vomiting. He'd eaten something terrible. And at one point he shouted, it's both ends, guys, it's both ends. <laughs> so we knew that it was going to be a long time to get him back on the stage, if at all, for the second set. But as luck would have it, having visited the wig shop, Rufus and I had a Frankie wig. And the first song in the set was, um, uh, um, oh, what was it? One Way Ticket, which Frankie starts with a, with a flamboyant sort of, yeah, getting the crowd going with cowbell. I was like, OK, I know what to do. I put on the Frankie wig, put on the Frankie glasses, and I went out and just eked out the the uh, cowbell intro for as long as I could until Frankie was ready to rejoin us um, with a bib and a nappy on, presumably. But um, it was pretty... Yeah, good. both... Had, well, <clears throat> when I designed my bathroom upstairs... <laughs> this, was, this is the best beginning to any story, by the way. <laughs> when I designed the bathroom upstairs, there was there was a bit of to and fro in between between me and Dev about where the bath was going to go and where the toilet was going to go. And my argument was, hmm. if I if I'm if I'm ill by any chance because I've, I've been in this situation before where um, 
where it's you can sit on the toilet but you can't you can't puke in the in the bath and that was my that was my whole rationale for putting the toilet next to the bath is yeah. for that situation having been yeah. having been there yeah. and both ends is not good is it no it's not i mean i it happened to me once That's um food it's actually one of the reasons why i don't eat meat anymore is because uh, i had an incident with um um a meal and it could have been it was it was uh, it was chinese food and not and this is no reflection on chinese food in general but this particular one something was wrong with it it was either the rice or the chicken and the first its symptoms were were fever like i actually f- felt like i was getting uh you know flu or something like that then i uh chanced one and it didn't go well if you see what i mean <laughs> um and i was in my bed when that happened so the, i spent the next nine days basically not able to eat anything without having to utilize both bath and toilet um so i totally agree with that layout it's, it's necessary unless you have like a a bowl that you can store somewhere do you know what i mean like, bowl. yeah like a puking bowl Maybe. Maybe I'll move the bath then. I don't know, it just, it, it can, it, it's not very nice if somebody's in the bath. That's the only issue. <laughs> you know, one of the other household members are having a, a relaxing. Okay, well, I can't say exactly who I'm referring to here, but there are people who have that sort of money and they show up to a thing and then they have like a team that swoop on them uh, anytime there's a camera around, they do all this stuff, and this person is like, um, "Yeah, yeah, I know it's vanity, but I'm losing this, so we've got to make sure this is, you know." And then that's fair um, enough. Yeah, and and it's completely straight up about it because it's their reputation. And but they haven't had any sort of surgical in- intervention. They what they do have is a team of highly paid professionals to make it look. like But you would, wouldn't you? I mean, if you're in the if you're in the public eye, then you you know, it's like. Uh, well, anybody who's in the public eye, if it, it, certain elements of the press will will pick on anything to demean to demean yeah. you, and I think, and that's that's fucking awful, isn't it? But you know, rather than say, "Oh, this person is brilliant," you know, they've invented a cure for cancer. They go, "Oh, look, he's losing his hair a bit at the back. He gives him this." <laughs> oh, the sunroof's open. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, woo-hoo. <laughs> um, yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a bit unfair. So I think that's fair enough, isn't it? Yeah, because it's just one less thing... That they can have a pop yeah, for. Yeah, one less stick for them to beat you with, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, bastards. The thing that I love about the music trade is how... Is how it... Is how it's just like... There's so many examples of male vanity that makes the whole thing about being a musician completely preposterous. Yeah, you know, like often, like for example, you and Brian. I mean, you look similar. There's no wigs going on. It's all natural. Um, but I did hear a story about um, one. There was, and I'm not going to name any names. Okay. There was an artist who was super successful, uh, did a world tour, um, and as a bonus for all of the musicians, had had all of them, gave all of them hair transplants as a Christmas bonus after a couple of years of touring. Really? And then when they came back touring like six months later, they all had full heads of their own hair that had migrated from another part of their head back up to the top there. That's a fantastic end of tour gift. Yeah. All we get, we get a T-shirt and a mug. <laughs> Blankety blank, checkbook and pen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean... It was the kind of level of touring where you'd expect a fancy watch or something like that, but instead, yeah. everybody got... Um... Hair transplant, what genius. Yeah. That's really genius. What about if you didn't true. need one? Pardon? What about if you didn't need one? Then you get a fancy watch. Or you get a, vo- you get a voucher for when you do need one in a few years. I'd have to... I'd have to I've, I've, I always... Because I've got a very hairy head. But I've, mm. got, I've got no hairs on my chest at all. Yeah. And I've all, that, that's always been a bit of a... It's a, it's a manly sign, isn't it? I think I might have one. I, um, I think I've got I, one, and it's, it's about, that, about that long. It happens to me as well. I, I, mean, I, just, I just think it's male, male vanity. It's one of my yeah, favourite things to, to pierce, really. It is, and, you know, it's the same with ladies. You know, ladies don't want to yeah, like, look old. And... Yeah, I, I mean, but there's a lot of different pressures on 
you know, the, sort of the beauty standards and all that stuff. And and there's a lot of um, self doubt, regardless of gender and stuff, that gets to that point. But there's just something extra funny about male vanity because it shouldn't be a thing. <laughs> there is because yeah, we're we're all big enough and old enough that we should just yeah care. yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think it's, it's self confidence as well, isn't it? It's it's you know. I don't give a shit what I look like, to be quite honest. That's part of your attraction, though. That's actually one of the reasons yeah, why you... Yeah. Oh, Deb's looking at me funny now. Well, we went out to a 21st birthday party on Saturday. Deb started get. We didn't go till half past eight. Deb started getting ready at two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> we had fashion shows. We had, do you like my hair like this? Do you like my hair like that? How about these boots? How about this dress? Should I wear this? Mm-hmm. Would I be more comfortable in this? What happens if I do this? And mm. at, 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 seven, at 7.45, I got in the shower and I was ready to go at five past eight. <laughs> and she just says, I hate you. <laughs> I hate you. There you go. Yeah, but when, when man folk lean into that vibe, that's the effortlessness is part of the attraction. And I'm sorry you to say so? that. Yeah, I'm sorry to say that. But the, le- the less you try, the better looking you are somehow. Is that a thing? Yeah, that's why. That's why we're well, Deb, dazzling. Deb wanted, put, Deb wanted to put guy line on me today. <laughs> I said, absolutely not. I am not wearing guy liner. Um, let's talk about let's talk about another theory that I know you have, um, and I don't know. I think I've talked about this uh, when I did a interview with um, Elizabeth Giroff, who's a, a brilliant um, a vocal expert. Now, you and I were discussing this and talking about how in a period of my career when I had a bit more weight, you were saying that the added ballast of that grounds my voice and makes me a better singer. I've got do you remember that conversation? This. I do remember that conversation. And I think, yeah, there's a reason why, I think there's a reason why most, not all, but most operatic singers are bigger. I think I think it I think it adds to them. That can't that can't be a that can't be an accident, surely. Yeah. Unless they're all just really lazy. I don't know what I mean. I think it adds more. I think it adds more bass, and I think there's more. It's like the size of a speaker. That's, uh, that's, that's how I think of it. It's like if you've got a little speaker like that compared to a, little, a big speaker like that, you've got more. There's more. More. Frequency. Yeah, it's like um, I think. This is just the sound, the sound, this is what, this is like the guitar, you plug it into the rest of your body and there's, there's so many, I mean, when we worked with uh, Roy Thomas Baker, who's a, a famously uh, produced some Queen stuff in the 70s, the, the, the big Queen stuff, you know, um, he was putting microphones all over the place, like on my armpit, you know, yeah. not, not round the back, but, you know, just sort of the stuff that was, that would resonate and, um, and, he, and I think he wanted to sort of, create because uh, when you're standing in a room with somebody that's singing who really has a voice it fills the room and it's not necessarily just the yeah. the mouth that it's coming out of is it it's kind of like uh, uh, well Ad- adam's like that i mean adam's a, a fantastic singer and he's sing yeah. when, when he's singing without a microphone at a sound check he's just if he's warming up or something his voice mm. is, it carries just he's got so oh. much so much yeah. power I mean, I wrote, uh, I wrote the first song on his first record and he was in the studio at Rob Cavallo's place in, in uh, Calabasas y- years ago when he was doing that. And he was singing somebody else's song, like it was the song that was at the end of 2012, you know, the, that movie. Yeah. Um, and I was listening to him singing, but outside the studio, which was soundproofed, acoustically treated, and you shouldn't be able to hear anything. You can't hear a drum set when it's playing. And I could hear his voice coming through the wall. It was so loud and really, I mean, such an impressive bit of um, pitching as well. Like he was right yeah. on it, you know, two or three takes done. And, and that's, uh, I think a lot of that, a lot of that must be, a lot of that uh, must be training. And, but a lot of it's just, yeah, people can just, you can either sing or you, I think you can either sing or you can't. It's like, it's like, um, like drummers, you know, people, people learn how to play drums, but, People can't learn how to be drummers. There's, and I'm sure you you know what I mean by that. It's there's certain drummers who's just like, oh my god, that person is just amazing. It's like to do with the feel and to do everything. And but you can learn how to play drums. I can play drums. I can hit drums, but I can't 
Yeah. I, I, I can't drum. Yeah. You know, someone like Rufus is just, you know, I think, I, I don't know if you know that's genetic or, but he's a, he's a drummer, isn't he? He's not a, he's, he's not. Yeah, he was born. He's not Roger Taylor's son who happens to play drums. He is a drum. He's a drummer. He's a real drummer in his own right and a totally different kind of drummer to, to Roger yeah. Taylor as well. And fair play to him for that. Actually, I need to thank you because it was you that um, suggested yes. that we that we give Rufus that landed a game. you with that idiot. <laughs> um, many years ago, it was uh, that was you that put us in touch, wasn't it? And said it was, you've yeah. got to give Rufus Dad, a game. Yeah, your brother, your brother phoned me in. So I'd spoken to him about Rufus before, and so you should you should try him if you're looking for a drummer. Um, and then, um, yeah, he called. I think when. Uh, is it Emily, your drummer, had left? Um, and he was, yeah, he was in Australia. And you had a, you had a, you had your album launch coming up at, at the Gibson Place. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and the rest is history. The rest is indeed history. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks he, for that. He used to do a good thing as well. Rufus, going back to um, the silly things that you do. He he used to go out um, and look around for the bootleg T-shirts. When he was playing at Queen, and and find like the worst one, and he bought one, he bought one. I don't know if he still got it. It was it was the four faces of Queen, but what, they all had massive heads, like unfeasibly big heads on these little bodies. And he bought it back him wearing it. And it was just it was genius. I don't know if he still got that one. That was quality. Yeah, I mean it's hard to like. Uh, I think in England it's a bit easier to to deal with bootleggers and stuff. But when you go somewhere like Italy. You got no chance. There's nothing you can do. You just got to embrace it. And a lot of the time, the stuff they're coming up with can can sometimes, occasionally, be better than the original designs. And you're like, why didn't we think of that? No, always better. better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But he's a he's a he's a lovely fellow, Rufus. I've I've known him since he was a, he's a kid, and he's he's always been completely unaffected by who his dad is. And yeah. very, very grounded, and very, very good company, and and fun. Mm. He's just, he's just a nice guy, isn't he? Yeah, really. and an incredible drummer. It's incredible, really, yeah. really great. I really thought that uh, we were going to lose him to the foos. I was just going to ask you that. Did you? Because I was like, oh god, I, I kind of, I, yeah, I was kind of hoping that um, that the foos might just say, well. If if you guys come and support us on the tour, then just then, then Rufus can just play for both <laughs> bands. <laughs> he'd be at, he'd be way about three stone by the end of it. Yeah, it's true. It'd be I've absolutely fucked. I mean, that's. I I mean, I said to Rufus, that's an unbelievable opportunity. If that comes along, you got to do it. And I yeah. I'd, be, I'd be angry with him if he didn't take it. You know, because you've got to you've got to let people go, go and do their thing when it's a, a thing like that. Um, and I and then I would talk to Dave Grohl about a transfer fee as well. You know, <laughs> his agent. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd be brokering the deal. You know? <laughs> It'd be the same as if if um, if our guys phoned you and said, Justin, um, Adam doesn't want to do this anymore. Do you fancy coming singing? You, I presume you'd just go, yep. Yeah, I'd go. Uh, it depends entirely on my availability uh, and. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> Let's have a little look at the diary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't. Um, yeah. yeah, you can't. Um, you There's can't. certain things that you just wouldn't be able to turn down. I think. Well, was it close? Do you know? I don't know anything about the the machinations right. of that stuff. Really, um, all I know is like when when um, you know when it became clear that the Foo Fighters were going to continue. To me, the obvious choice would be. Rufus, you know, for yeah. for a, at least until Shane's ready, that was kind of like that's how I saw it going. The the only mm-hmm. thing the only thing I think that possibly be, would be against against Rufus and nothing to do with, is his his style of drumming is mm-hmm. clearly influenced so much by Taylor. Yeah, and he also looks a lot like him. Yeah. So it would. What I think that may be one of the things that would be not yeah. in his favour. It's too obvious, do you know what I mean? Yeah, maybe, but there was just so much speculation. Um, and I think it was becoming a bit uh, frustrating for Rufus as well, like just, yeah. you know, in terms of just having having that kind of hanging over him for a bit. And... Yeah. 
wondering. Yeah, yeah, it would be the obvious choice, wouldn't it, really? But Yeah, but, I mean, Josh Freeze is, is, is almost the obvious choice because I think that was kind of the original plan, I think, in the very, very early days would have been Josh Freeze in, in the Foo Fighters. So it makes sense. Yeah. You know, well, he's great, isn't he? He's an amazing drummer. There's, like, there's, they've got so many brilliant drummers at their disposal. It could be, could have been any one from the older. I was drummer. just going to say, uh, those uh, the, the the trippy gigs, the the drumming on talent there, uh, the drumming, yeah, yeah. sorry, the drumming talent on show there was, um, you know, d- 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 drummers have I think have become, they, the drummers didn't used to be focal points of bands, did they? It was they, it was very much. The singer and the guitar player. But I actually think that you know John Bonham, Roger Taylor. There's there are there are some exceptions to that. There is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those those two and and um, maybe Tommy Lee as well. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I guess. I guess that was the whole sort of just sort of big flamboyant. Do you know what I mean, though? Do, do you know what I mean? And it's just, but I I I appreciate good drumming now, whereas it didn't. It used to just sort of passed me by really it was just something that happened the first the first guy i noticed ever as a drummer i think was is this uh, the guy from blondie is it clem burke oh yeah yeah um i mean some of their stuff in the 70s and i'd only have been you know 14 or 15 then i remember thinking wow that he's really made that that's he's really made that part of that song his own mm-hmm. it's like playing a, a guitar solo or so and and stuart copeland yeah stuart well. copeland is amazing love that and song. still amazing isn't he he's yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So, yeah, I guess I've just disproved my point, haven't I? There's just... <laughs> I think you've always been aware of drummers. You just haven't been prepared to admit yeah, it before. Appreciate them as much, yeah. But, yeah, but all those those guys at the Taylor thing, just immensely good. Yeah, that's, it was fabulous. fantastic, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was good. Oh, one thing I want to ask you about... Um, so you have, like, when you're doing Brian stuff... You have um, there's a bit of switching that you have to do for certain delays and chorus stuff, right? Um, now I've stood next to you when you're working. You have a flight case that pr- looks like one that you might have a mixing desk in, like a big sort of cubic one, haven't you? Um, and then, so presumably you've got a spare head in the bottom there somewhere, or some some other kind of um, nothing. No, it's it's all the effects. It's the it's the radio. The switching yeah. system, um, there's a power conditioner at the bottom. Mm. But the top layer, mm. top layer cut into the foam is stuff to put... Like big red right. buttons? No, you've got like... There's, uh, there is a big red button, but there's also like some crystal uh, tumblers and uh, some, some alcoholic uh, beverages in there, isn't there? No. <laughs> You've, oh, okay. Sorry, that's my bad. I'm thinking of someone else. I've never d- no, that's <clears throat> I d- yeah. Drinking on duty. No, no. But I think, but I think you pour it for Brian, right? For the encore, right? Uh, no, somebody does. Um, somebody does, and 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 he will. He usually have a caramel vodka um, mm. with ice. Very, very, very nice. And he ca- and what he when he comes up for um, the encore, which is rock you. Um, he he'll give it to me, and I'll drink it. That's my little that's my little present. Oh, that's your I can tell if he's I can tell if he's upset with me because he doesn't bring me a drink. Yeah, it spits it in your face. Yeah. <laughs> Wanker. So, ah, oh, that's really cool. Um, you ever had a situation where anybody from the band's been so drunk you've had to push them up on the stage like that? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Enough said. Um, that was at. I think it might have been Brian's Brian's birthday party. Um, Roger was very drunk, and uh, we had to push we had to push Roger up onto the drum stool, and he was still brilliant. He couldn't stand up, and he was still absolutely brilliant. brilliant. Yeah, but um, but apart from yeah, a long time ago now. Yeah, yeah but um, yeah, it's, it's just yeah, it's. Yeah, it's um, yeah. It's 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 funny. I've seen um, the drunkest person I've ever seen play was Steve Lukather. I'm glad you didn't say me then. No, well, yeah, we knew you in the drinky days, but I don't. 
I don't um, ever remember you. But I, mean, I, th- I think the first time we ever met you guys was was at that air guitar thing, and we went, we all we all went out and got loads of Pedro Grigio and got smashed in the afternoon. Do you remember that? <laughs> that sounds familiar. But I think, yeah, um, yeah I think I, I would always wait until after the second song, sort of before I started get drinking really heavily. You know, that would be but, but, but Steve Lukather, that. Mm. And he doesn't drink. I think he doesn't. He doesn't drink anymore. But he was really drunk at one of the. He played at one of the. I think it was the opening of the Las Vegas We Will Rock You show, and he was there, and he was very drunk. Still brilliant. Yeah. Still brilliant. That's what you're yeah. used to, isn't it? It's some conditional yeah, memory. He's, he's stopped now, hasn't he? He's clean now. Oh, well, last time, yeah, we played with Toto in. Uh, God, that was a few years ago now. But he was sober as a judge and utterly hilarious. A really, really. Yeah, he's good company guy. and fantastic guitar player. Yeah, well. I think he's the all the guitarists love him. Yeah, you know he's like one. He's the guitarist's guitarist, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, like um, like Jeff Beck and um, yeah. and um, uh, what's his name, Paul Gilbert, I think. Yeah, it's just every guitarist. I was like, wow. I mean, Paul Gilbert is just mm. off the scale, brilliant. Yeah. Um, so who's your who's your your favourite guitar player of all time then? Just go on. Uh, I would have one. to say. Well, if I picked one, I couldn't pick one. I, can I pick four? Yeah. Brian, Angus, um, Eddie, and Mark. Mark. Knopfler. Knopfler. Wow. I wouldn't have, I probably would have guessed the other three. I don't think I'd have guessed. Yeah, because I I try and do a bit of hybrid, with a bit, you know, fingery, pickery stuff. The clawing. I do like it. Again, bit... another guitar player is totally recognisable. As yeah. soon as he plays, you go, that's Nofler. Yeah. And I also, I'm really fond of things like um, Richard Thompson. I really like um, uh, Jerry Reed as well, that sort of classical guitar, chicken picking mm-hmm. stuff. I think anything that's sort of unique and, you know, that you can see a hundred miles away. I like I like guitar players of character, uh, expression, and dynamics. Uh, where where would Gary Moore rate on your? Oh, list? I used to love Gary Moore actually. Yeah, I was a big fan of his. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah. I think if I had to pick one, he would, he would be my favourite of the blues rock guys. He's a great the blues. The massively aggressive blues rock yeah. stuff is just phenomenal. For yeah, because that's that's reimagining that genre a little bit, isn't it? And sort of yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, nice guy as well. I met, I met him a couple of times. He was very, very nice to me. He told me about when they supported ACDC, Thin Lizzy, and they were a bit too good, and ACDC's management were pulling all the leads out of the desk. <laughs> <laughs> Great story. I love stories like that. It's awesome, that is. They're just a bit too good, so they cut them off, pulled all the leads out. Fantastic. Fantastic. Nice one. Well, this has been brilliant. Thanks, Pete. Um, oh, mate, it's a pleasure. I'm going to sing the theme tune and yes. sign off. You're welcome to join me. Am I going to go deep again? <clears throat> yeah, you give me the last. Justin Hawkins rides, rides again. 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 Hey. Amazing. Nice one. All right. That was so good, Pete. Well done. Thank you for watching. Um, Let me know what you thought of our conversation in the comments section below. Um, Next week, I'll be interviewing the legendary guitarist Richie Kotzen. I absolutely cannot wait. Um, So, yeah, until then, I'll see you next Monday. Nice one, guys. Cheers. Okay.